the recording. It is my honor today to address you as the acting convener of the Coalition for the ICC, and as such on behalf of our many civil society member organizations around the world. It is my great pleasure to welcome you to today's celebration of International Criminal Justice Day, during which we are marking 25 years of civil society engagement in the Rome Statute System of Justice. This event is co-organized by Australia, Austria, Finland, Ireland, Liechtenstein, the Netherlands, the state of Palestine, Sierra Leone, Switzerland, and Uruguay. It was 23 years ago tomorrow that the Rome Statute was adopted, creating hope for accountability for the most serious crimes known to humanity. The Rome Statute was and remains a groundbreaking achievement. Today, we honor this achievement by reaffirming the Coalition for the ICC's unwavering support for the ICC and Rome Statute systems. The Coalition for the ICC and its members continue to work together as the world's largest civil society partnership for international justice. We are committed to working together towards a strengthened court, better able to meet the ambitions of its founders and to adapt to the opportunities, demands, and circumstances of today. The member organizations of the coalition appreciate the unique consultative status we've had with the court and the Assembly of States parties since the very beginning, a status that builds on the recognition of the importance of civil society in the final act of the Rome Conference of 1998. As civil society, it is our responsibility to hold the court and its state's parties to the norms of fair, effective, and independent justice to which they aspire. As the coalition, it is also our mandate to continue to serve as a bridge between the court and the communities it works affects most. Through all of this, civil society organizations and human rights defenders around the world who are engaged in the effort to bring perpetrators of international crimes to fair justice face ongoing threats to their lives and families because of their work. This serves as a reminder to all that there is more to be done to strengthen the court's ability to meet the expectations and challenges inherent to its ambitious mandate. This, particularly at a time when crimes defined in the Rome Statute continue to be committed in far too many places around the globe. Despite the challenges, today's celebration gives us a chance to reflect on the unique opportunities to improve the Rome Statute system. Whether through the review of the ICC process, the lessons learned exercise on election processes, the monitoring of the new ICC situations and the delivery of reparations, civil society remains deeply invested in the success of the Rome Statute system to advance the fight against impunity for the sake of future generations. On this day, we look to the future with renewed enthusiasm and motivation to pursue the fight against impunity and we stand ready to facilitate the engagement of CICC members around the world with ICC and ASP processes. With that, let me now turn to our esteemed speakers. We're most grateful to have you all with us today. Let me first give the floor to a dear friend of the coalition, Her Excellency, the President of the Assembly of States Parties, Ms. Silvia Fernandez de Gubendi. Madam President, the floor is yours. Thank you, thank you, Melinda. Excellencies, distinguished members of civil society, distinguished colleagues and friends, greetings to all. It is my distinct pleasure to speak to, do, to you in this important event to commemorate the Day of International Justice and 25 years of engagement of civil society organizations in the making of the Rome Statute. I would like to start by warmly congratulating the coalition for all its actions during more than two decades to promote and support the creation, the setup, and the effective functioning of the International Criminal Court. It would not be an overstatement to say that without its huge, perseverant, and imaginative contributions, the Rome Statute system as we know it would not exist today. Let me pay a personal tribute to Mr. William Pace, Bill, the talented convener of the CICC who had the commitment, the skills and the temperament to lead and hold together this impressive and ever growing umbrella organization since its inception until his well-deserved recent retirement in 2019. Thank you, Bill. I congratulate Ms. Melinda Reed for taking up the important role of acting convener. I extend to her my best wishes and my support for her new activities. As some of you are aware, I was myself also involved 
in the ICC system during these 25 years in various capacities as diplomat, staff member, judge, and president of the court. And now again, as president of the assembly. I am privileged to have witnessed the critical contributions of the coalition to international criminal justice throughout these years. The coalition was a driving force during the negotiations of the Rome Statute. It worked in partnership with a group of like-minded states, but also beyond states in favor of the expeditious establishment of a strong, impartial, and independent court. The coalition contributed with advocacy, ideas, and initiatives. Most importantly, they brought to the room the voice of victims and the sounds of truth. Among other important aspects, civil society was indeed instrumental in promoting a gender perspective and in providing victims with access to justice and reparations. In 2010, its members filled the city of Kampala as they had filled Rome before to push again for an effective outcome. After the entry into force of the statute, the coalition stepped in to mobilize international support for the relatively fragile young court and to promote universality by vibrantly campaigning for the ratification and implementation of the statute. When needed, the coalition was also active in addressing situations where withdrawals were being considered. As a result of their actions, together with those of the court and the assembly, we have now 123 state parties. This is indeed a significant number, representing approximately two thirds of the world, but certainly many more are needed. The assembly counts on the continuing contribution of the coalition to help enhancing the universality of the system. Achieving universality and strengthening the functioning of the system are both top priorities of the assembly as they are both crucial to increase the legitimacy and effectiveness of the court. With respect to the latter, I note that the CICC and its individual members have also greatly contributed to the actual functioning of the system by providing substantive reports on specific issues or promoting initiatives to improve procedures. The recent adoption by the Bureau of a due diligence process that will be applied to the upcoming election of the deputy prosecutor is just one recent example of efforts made by the assembly to enhance its procedures in light of such initiatives. Some years ago, the coalition also took important steps to improve the selection process of judicial candidates, such as asking nominees to fill out questionnaires, seeking to interview them and hosting public debates between them. Most importantly, in 2010, the coalition established the independent panel on ICC judicial elections in order to provide independent expert assessment of the qualifications of the candidates. These initiatives were the precursors inter alia of the establishment by the Assembly of State Parties of the extremely important Advisory Committee on Nominations in 2012. These are only two, albeit major, examples of the positive impact of the coalition's actions on the effectiveness of the system. I look forward to its contributions during the current review mechanism, which will entail a transparent and inclusive dialogue among all stakeholders. Last but not least, let me underline the importance of the coalition's activities to address also the external challenges, which have been huge and sometimes unprecedented in recent years. I take the opportunity to thank the coalition for its enormous efforts to address these challenges and counter sometimes frontal attacks against the court and some of its officials. While we all hope to navigate calmer waters in the future, we count on the coalition and its members to continue to stand ready to support efforts of the assembly to enhance cooperation and support for the ICC system. In closing, I would like to pay a tribute to my many friends and colleagues who have participated in the work of the coalition throughout all these years. I have been honored to work with many of them personally, and I am extremely happy to see some of them still with us 
some around this virtual table. I look forward to working with all of you during my new mandate as president of the Assembly of State Parties of the ICC. I express my deep gratitude to the coalition for 25 years of brave history in support of the court. Congratulations to you all on International Justice Day. Thank you. Thank you very much, Madam President. It is now my honor to turn the floor to ICC's first Vice President, Ms. Luz del Carmen Ibanez Carranza. The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair. Uh, dear uh, Mrs. Reed, Acting Convener of the Coalition for the ICC, Madam President of the Assembly of State Party, Mr. Prosecutor, Mr. Registrar, Mr. Bill Pérez, wonderful to see you again. Uh, Mr. Murukuti, Mr. Obias Gu, Excellency, team representatives of the civil society, ladies and gentlemen. Let me start by conveying the regrets of President Kovmansky for not being able to join you today. He's on holiday. In this absence, I am very happy to make brief remarks in my capacity as acting president of the court. At the outset, uh, I would like to commend the coalition for the ICC for convening this event to mark the day of the International Criminal Justice. The 17th of July may be just one of the 365 days in the calendar, but it has great symbolic value. The adoption of the Rome Statute on 17th July 1998 was a moment of truly historic significance. It finally brought to fruition decades of effort by countless people to create a permanent international criminal court. As such, the 17th July reminds us about the importance of determination. International justice is not a 100 meter sprint. International justice requires tireless work with a clear vision of a common purpose. That common purpose is enshrined in the Rome Statute, and it should always serve as our motivation. The preamble of the statute recalls that over the course of history, millions of women, men, and children have fallen victim to imaginable crimes that always entail grave violations of the human rights. The preamble expresses the determination of the international community to put an end to the impunity for the perpetrators of such crimes, and as such, contribute to their prevention. A first day of 17th July will always serve as a reminder of why we work for international uh, justice. For the sake of justice and for victims in service of the international community to help build safer, more just world for the future generations. The adoption of the Rome Statute was also a shining example of the power of multilateralism. The overwhelming majority of the world's sovereign states participated in the process of drafting and negotiating the statute. And the statute created a system that is fundamentally, fundamentally based on cooperation and the collective action of the international community. As such, the 17th of July reminds us that we must work together to advance the fight against impunity. No one can do it alone. Where we speak of ICC personnel, state officials, witnesses, counsel for the defense and the victims, we all have our respective part to play. And of course, I must add to that list also civil society, 
which has a crucial role in the Rome status system. The advocacy of civil society was crucial indeed to the ratification and implementation of the statute in countless state parties. NGOs have forcefully supported the court's independence in the face of pressure that threat and even sanctions. We are extremely grateful to all of those who raised their voice during the most difficult moments and spoke up in the court's defense. We are aware that the coalition for the ICC is undergoing a major transition, the biggest of uh, its history. I take this opportunity to congratulate to the coalition on its 25 years of critical, important work for the international justice. We wish to see that work continue over the next quarter of century with the same vigor for the good of the international criminal justice. Thank you. Thank you very much, Madam Vice President. I would now like to turn the floor to the recently sworn in prosecutor of the ICC, Mr. Kareem Khan. The floor is yours. It seems as though perhaps have we lost Mr. Prosecutor. Sorry, I have two microphones. Oh, and quite all right. There you are. Start. But can I just say, Melinda, thank you so much for the invitation uh, to um, be present and to participate in this really august occasion. Uh, President Sylvia de Gamende, uh, Vice President Ibanez, uh, Excellencies, and ladies and gentlemen, members of the coalition of the ICC, and really friends, because this is what this group is. It's a group of friends, a group of individuals united by common purpose that the world needs to grow up, it needs to mature, it needs to protect the weakest and the most vulnerable, and it needs to, to do so with a basic yardstick of norm that no individual of rational mind and good conscience can repudiate. Uh, this body of law, as I stated during my swearing in, uh, is not the preserve of the Hague, uh, it is owned by humanity. It is without borders. It is owned by the Muslim world, the West, the East, by irrespective of religions or regions or legal norms, legal cultures. And the work that the CIC did, the first 25 members that came together with this vision, with this dream, that unfortunately the continued failings of man, and we really overwhelmingly they were men, required a court of last resort to give life the promise of never again, which is an embarrassment, because we see since the awful crimes of the Holocaust, again and again and again has become the norm. So how do we stop hiding behind this plaintive cry of the victims and the survivors and looking at accountability mechanisms after the event, after lives have been shattered, families, families have been torn apart um, into a world where people have a right to struggle with what's important, raising their families and trying to have hope. And I think this court and its vision realizing the rich mosaic of nations, uh, looking at also the UN Charter and the beautifully drafted preamble to the Rome Statute, realize that uh, this court, based upon these essential principles of humanity, was unfortunately absolutely necessary. So really with uh, all of you uh, that are online today, Bill Pace, I see uh, David, uh, Donald Catton, Melinda, so many, uh, Richard Dick has so many friends and colleagues. I take my hat off to each and every one of you, uh, not only as a, uh, as a new prosecutor, but um, on behalf of the whole of the office that I now have the honor to lead to acknowledge your important role. 
Judge Ibana said that uh, international criminal justice is a marathon and not a sprint. My own humble view is we need to catch our second breath rapidly. Because whilst this court, this building, this body of law is evolving, people are still suffering. There are myriad accountability gaps. And even where the footprint of the court is present, we need to be non-defensive and recognize we can collectively do better. Uh, I, of course, need to do better. The institution is endeavoring to do better, and we'll do better together with states with the coalition, with uh, NGOs, with survivors. And my own plea, in order for us to get our second breath, we need to constantly widen this circle of friendship. There shouldn't be people that are excluded. We should reach out our hand in good faith and be willing to embrace anybody with this common values that we all share. And I think if we do that, we have a difficult job, but a realistic chance to make sure that the promise of the Rome Statute, the aims of the Rome Statute, can actually lead to greater impact, not just because of the presence of the court, but the result of that. The result of that should be you know, justice for past crimes, but of course, collective efforts, these different networks, these different bridges that we need to consolidate and build and reinforce amongst state parties, non-state parties, NGOs, victim groups, survivor groups, religious groups, civil society groups. I think all of that is important if you're going to um, ensure, as I said when I was sworn in, that tomorrow can be better, more peaceful, more hopeful than today. And the final remark is, of course, the my engagement. I think uh, I've said it uh, a few times, but we need to be honest about what international criminal justice can do and what it can't do. If the aim is to prevent genocide in these worst types of crimes, the rule of law in all its forms, including international criminal law, is absolutely essential. But the right to access to education, the right to access healthcare, the right for economic opportunity, the right to build, and the obligation, in fact, to build democratic institutions, are all essential components to help prevent states descending into these or, or filling these vacuums that tend to get created by poor governance that allow these types of crimes to be committed. So we should move forward in the next stage, united of purpose, but not navel gazing amongst ourselves, looking outward and building bridges to new partners that we have not currently embraced. But I think together, hopefully, we can make some strides in this continued journey of the marathon that Judge Ibana has mentioned. So thank you again for the opportunity to speak today. I thank each and every one of you, and I look forward to getting to know as many of you as possible in the period ahead. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Mr. Prosecutor. Our next speaker will be Peter Lewis, the ICC Registrar. Mr. Lewis, the floor is yours. Um, thank you very much, uh, Melinda. And um, uh, I'm very delighted and honored to be able to speak to you today and follow in such distinguished uh, footsteps as the ASP president, who um, I had the great, great pleasure and privilege to work with when uh, she was uh, uh, played a leading role in the prep comms for the rules of procedure and evidence. Um, the first vice president, um, our new prosecutor, and so, so many other uh, distinguished speakers to follow including, of course, uh, the beloved Bill. Um, Melinda, I just wanted to uh, have a few sort of moments of reflection and then look forward on some practical issues. Uh, this is my, I think, fourth of these uh, meetings uh, that I've been. And my first one uh, in 2018, when I was uh, just appointed the registrar, the court looked in a really difficult position to me. Um, I think there was uh, real concerns that one could feel about whether the court was doing the right things, behaving in the right, the right way. And it felt to me there was a considerable gap between the, um, the great 
wave of enthusiasm and idealism that had led to the creation of the court and the reality that states felt they were experiencing you know, in 2018. And um, as, we, as we were to find out, um, and we were then to face significant external uh, pressure of an absolutely unparalleled nature. And at the same time, um, there was a real concern about what was going to happen with the caseload. We were at that stage seeing the end of the, the legacy case uh, cases. Cases were at that stage in their final uh, throws of cases that had started many years before, and it was uncertain where the next cases would come from. And I know also um, from, I think, some, some really intense engagement we had uh, with the coalition at, this, at the, um, the round table events, that there was real concern in, uh, among civil society about whether the, the ideal, again, the, the ideal that they had supported, you had supported for so long was being realized. Well, things feel very different today. Um, they really do. And I, I, after such a difficult uh, period, I do want to uh, convey a sense of real optimism, um, but challenges too. So the optimism, I think, comes from we survived a pretty incredible test uh, over the last, particularly last year, a test of our re resilience, of our support, of whether, as Karim says, you know, we were together as a group to support each other. An amazing, difficult time, but what a stress test of a collective that's uh, the ICC, the states, people in the court and civil society. What a stress test, but what a result to emerge from that, I think with a real sense, perhaps a renewed sense of just how precious this organization was and we needed to get behind it and work for it. So surviving something like that is hugely, I think, important. Um, a, a real sense, I think certainly for me within the building of a, a sense of renewal through leadership. And this, please, I don't want this to be misunderstood of any reflection on the wonderful people who have led and uh, worked with this organization uh, in, the, in the past, all of us, standing on their mighty shoulders and you know one should never underestimate their their work but with so much change coming at the same time change obviously in the presidency of the ASP in the leadership of uh, the with the presidency of the court six new judges six fantastic new judges by the way and a new prosecutor here and with more changes to that leadership uh, to come over the next couple of years there is a real sense, I, I feel, of renewal in the court and energy. Uh, certainly that you, you can feel if you, if you work here that, you know, uh, a sense of renewal and focus uh, for the future. And I think we're all feeding off the new ideas uh, that are coming into the court over this period. And of course, um, we've got this fantastic gift of the independent expert review. Um, any organization, any institution that hopes to thrive and develop must hold itself up to external scrutiny. Um, sometimes that's going to be difficult. Um, and you know, there were some really tough messages uh, in the expert reviews uh, report, but what a gift to have that degree, you know, some really, really impressive people having the time to focus on the court, give us a real external uh, review, point to what we could uh, do better, force us to challenge ourselves. That is a fantastic gift. Uh, and the work is at last, the work is changing. I will be presenting the budget of the court, proposed budget for 2022 next Thursday. And um, as I've made no secret of, uh, the court will be asking for more resources, but it's for a good reason. It's for the very welcome reason that the workload is increasing. And it doesn't look to me like this is a short-term 
blip for 2022. You know, we've got, we know we've now got four trials, amazingly, fantastically, four trials uh, now that we know about for next year. We're already waiting another case, awaiting confirmation, which I'm sure will, if, it's a, if it is confirmed, will feature in 2023. And if you look what's happening in the world, you read the press reports and our own uh, information we're receiving, I think there's more to come. So instead of being a court of three years ago, wondering where the next case was coming from, wondering if we'd ever execute some of these warrants, suddenly we're in, the, in a place uh, where I think you and we can feel more confident of the work uh, that's coming. So it feels to me like it's a great, a really great period of renewal, but with periods of renewal, with periods of uh, great opportunity, uh, there's great challenges too. Uh, and the most significant challenge is you won't rise. The court will not rise to these opportunities and will not be able to uh, grasp them and take them and strengthen itself. Um, and in that context, I think now all that 25 years of work that the coalition has done to su support or to create us, uh, to support us, uh, to get on our feet, to help us mature and develop, you know, we are going to need, I think, as significant a, uh, an effort now uh, to help us really take advantage of the position uh, we're now in. And that's in all sorts of different ways. Uh, your support will will be required. One of the one of the ultimate ul ironies, really, is that at a, the time when we need more resources for the court, and I, you know, I'll be, I will, won't shy away from saying that we do need more resources now to deal with these cases. Of course, the economies of the world are in a desperate situation, and that's going to show itself in many ways. One is, uh, as you know, we've got a liquidity. Uh, crisis. And certainly last year, we were in very, very difficult position at the end of the year where there was the real prospect we would not have enough money to keep the court open uh, for December. Actually, it was probably halfway through November. I mean, at that stage, where certainly those of us in the court who are responsible for these things were looking at the real prospect, we wouldn't get through to the end of that year. We'd have to shut down. Now, through the enormous support, and I, I'm on this screen today is certainly, uh, I think, the first individual I spoke to uh, and asked for his country's support to see us through the end of that, that year, through the magnificent support of a number of states who could help us, you know, bridge that gap by making early payment. We managed to survive that, but we've got equal problems this year about arrears. We need your support uh, in capitals, in your countries, to impress upon everybody um, just how much uh, we can, uh, we rely on you know, the financial support of, of states to get us through this, uh, this period. So your support there on the arrears issue is going to be hugely important. I hope your advocacy uh, for the additional resources. Again, that will be, I'm sure, enormously uh, helpful um, to us too. But on the independent expert review, we need your help. Uh, as the president of the ASP has said, she's committed, made it clear to us this is going to be an inclusive process, and we certainly want it uh, to be. But there are many difficult issues uh, for us to deal with that we haven't been able to solve on our own for various reasons, too complex, too difficult, too time consuming, but nonetheless problems that we have struggled with. And we're going to need your help uh, to make a difference and to find practical solutions. I think what the independent expert review has said to us, you know, there are things you put off too long. You need to find solutions and make things happen now, but we're going to need your help. And, you know, just looking at some of the, the registry priorities, of you know the change to the culture of the court. Of course, that's huge 
a priority for the prosecutor is absolutely in the lead on, on that as well. But, you know, legal aid, we've struggled to find a legal aid policy that we can get agreement on. The creation of a new defence office, a fantastically exciting and but challenging uh, issue to get that right. The position of country offices we've talked about so long uh, that I think everybody feels we're not there yet, but, you know, we haven't really settled the philosophy around it. Governance, again, and a lot of issues about victims, the centrality of their role in the system and how we make that a reality. So um, I'll finish there, but my plea is, Melinda, you know, all that 25 years of sustained support, I think the next few years is going to be a fantastic time, uh, a fantastic opportunity, and with your help, I'm sure we're going to uh, make a success of it. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Mr. Lewis. It is my pleasure next to introduce Mr. Chino Abiyawu, the chair of the Nigerian Coalition for the ICC. Chino, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Melinda. Um, the president of the court, the prosecutor, uh, colleagues. Um, I want to first congratulate the new officials of the court, especially the president, the prosecutor, the registrar, and all the members of the bureau um, for assuming office. And want to say that on behalf of my colleagues in the civil society, that we pledge our support to the court as we've done in the last 25 years. Um, I agree completely with the registrar that there is a sense of uh, renewal uh, in the court and energy and a sense of new focus. And that is very uh, reassuring, especially for uh, civil societies uh, working uh, in the South, especially in African institution countries. It, it is a very welcome development. Um, but for that energy, for that renewal, and for that refocusing to have impact, there is a need for the assembly of state parties to re refocus also its priorities. And I'm looking at three key areas. One is the resources of the court. In, like, like the registrar said, there are new challenges, there are new opportunities, there are new cases, there are increasing, increasing workloads. And of course, increased expectation of the world community that the court will do more to fight impunity across the world. So we expect that the ASP should reconsider his policy of zero nominal growth of the budget of the court. Um, it is important that if the court is not properly resourced, it will undermine its effectiveness, its integrity, and its independence. Uh, another area of importance or priority is for the ASP to provide more political protection for the officials of the court. We also, in the last two or three years, that the, the prosecutor, the former prosecutor, and a number of officials of the court faced very serious political threats, which undermined the effectiveness. And I think it's important that being officials of a court, they do not have a voice of their own because they have to remain independent. So the, if their voice is the voice of the ASP, the ASP should stand to, to ensure that such political threats uh, do not. Um, arise to undermine the work of the court. But importantly is that 2021, this year, is like a funny corner for the court, not only because the independent expert review has thrown up you know, areas of challenges that the court needs to address, but I think across the world, including the United States, there is a change of government and there is a, change, it is a reduction in political threats. So this is a momentum that the ASP and the court should seize to ensure that victims across the world are reassured that they will get justice. Uh, finally, we want to um, encourage the court and officials to engage more with regional bodies, especially you know, bodies like African Union, because those kind of blocks can help to integrate and make more inclusive the work of the ASP. So I want to join uh, colleagues to congratulate the court on, on this 25th anniversary of International Justice Day and to pledge the support of civil society, including those in Africa, to continue to work with the court to achieve the global end. Thank you very much.
Thank you so much, Gina. Our next speaker today will be Angela Mudukuti, who's a lawyer and the Associate Advocacy Officer at the Open Society Justice Initiative. Angela, the floor is yours. Thank you, Melinda, and good day to you all. Madam President, Prosecutor Khan, Madam Vice President, Registrar Lewis, Ms. Melinda Reed, Mr. Bill Pace, Mr. Chino Obiagu, distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen, it is indeed a pleasure to be with you all as we mark International Justice Day. My very heartfelt thanks to the organizers for bringing us all together. Thank you for your hard work. I'd like to also begin by welcoming the new leadership, prosecutor, the ASD president, and the ICC presidency. We wish you every success during your time in office, and we look forward to working with you. Civil society organizations have been an integral part of the international criminal justice landscape since the court's inception, and we endeavor to remain engaged, supportive, and constructively critical. Whilst our respective organizations have different mandates and sometimes different views, we all want the same thing, a more efficient and effective court that meets the demands of justice where it has jurisdiction. As the court enters a new phase with new leadership, it's important to remain cognizant of the significance of meaningful engagement with both civil society and affected communities, particularly in situation countries. To ensure meaningful engagement, the court must develop a better understanding of the concerns of affected communities and must direct sufficient human and financial resources to these efforts. This of course includes improving field presence, outreach, communication. And of course, we know the independent expert review process has provided some key recommendations in that respect. In order to have better relationships with external actors, the court also needs to proactively address its internal struggles, including workplace misconduct and gender parity. We welcome all the statements, speeches, and relevant reports from the court that signal serious intent to improve the situation. And we note again that the IER process has yielded salient recommendations here as well. We look forward to continued engagement with the court and its principles as they consider the best way forward on all of these issues. The success and failure of the Rome Statute system not only lies with the court, but with states parties as well. And we also welcome the opportunity to continue to engage with the Assembly and work towards our shared vision of an effective court. We urge the Assembly to continue to support the court, which includes, as has been mentioned, defending it in the face of unjust political attacks, providing the necessary financial support, and pushing the court to improve whilst respecting its prosecutorial and judicial independence. We all know that the court operates in a highly politically charged environment and has an ever increasing caseload, making consistent state party support more important than ever before. We'd also like to take this opportunity to encourage the assembly to enhance levels of engagement and interaction with us civil society, and to do this in an open, inclusive and transparent manner. We look forward particularly to working with the ASP review mechanism, the presidency and all the other ASP bodies. Ladies and gentlemen, the ICC is indeed an integral part of the international criminal justice landscape, but it is just one part. Celebrating International Justice Day and the Rome Statute obliges us to continue to support complementarity and all forms of international justice, including other tribunals, other mechanisms, and domestic systems grappling with justice for core international crimes. The ICC was not designed to bear the burden alone, and so developing, supporting, and promoting other credible and impartial justice mechanisms is essential. International Justice Day is the perfect moment to reflect on the significant progress that has been made since 1998. But it's also a reminder that the road ahead is long as core international crimes and the desperate calls for accountability persist. So despite the obstacles, despite the disappointment, let us not be complacent, let us not be disheartened, and let us not become cynical. Together, we, civil society, the court, the assembly, and all the stakeholders can make a positive impact. And I assure you that as civil society, we will remain steadfast in our efforts to bring justice to all of those in need. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Angela. Our final speaker for today's celebration is Mr. Bill Pace, my predecessor as the coalition's convener from 1995 to 2019. Bill, you have the floor. Thank <laughs> you. 
unmute. Oh, just a moment. We're having some technical difficulties. I'm sorry. <laughs> there you are. Okay. Now, thank you, Melinda. Um, and uh, greetings to friends and colleagues and leaders of the uh, Rome statute system of international criminal justice. Uh, special thanks to uh, uh, President Silvia Fernandez de Gramonde for your kind words to me and the coalition. Uh, and special appreciation also to Judge Ibanez, Prosecutor Khan, Registrar Peter Lewis, Chino, uh, Angela, uh, many CICC and government colleagues. Um, several of us uh, here today were at our founding meeting in February 1995. We now can view uh, the decade of the 1990s as a rare moment of extraordinary opportunity and progress for strengthening democratic global governance and international cooperation. One that began to unravel in terrible events at the beginning of the 21st century in 2001. But the ICC and strengthened international humanitarian law enforcement are needed as much today as at any time in the last 100 years. Uh, the principle of complementarity in the Rome Statute is as fundamental going forward in 2021 uh, not only in international humanitarian law, but in confronting all matters of challenges facing the world community, a politics, survival of democratic institutions, human rights, um, economics, environment, control of disease. On the ICC and Rome statute, I will raise one observation. Uh, note that I hope I'm wrong, but it appears to me that during the first 20 years, the level of understanding, expertise, and commitment to the Rome Statute and the ICC was much greater and deeper amongst governments, ministers, uh, our ministries, uh, diplomatic community, um, uh, among international organization leaders at the UN, uh, amongst parliamentarians, civil society organizations, and especially among media and journalists, that we must continue to redouble our efforts in education about the Rome Statute and the ICC. Uh, Bill, we've lost your audio. I think you, you might have hit a mute button. I don't know where. Okay. You're back. Okay. I, I was just saying that um, that the level of expertise in governments and in ministries and in international organizations uh, amongst legislators uh, was much deeper, I think, uh, in the first 20 years than it is at present. And so this educational goal uh, must be, I think, one of our most important uh, challenges that we need to face as civil society and the coalition. Um, and this was one of the original purposes of International uh, Justice Day when we uh, established it in 1999 and 2000. Uh, so again, I want to thank uh, the coalition staff, uh, Melinda, the ICC and ASB uh, leaders, and to CICC colleagues. This was when we met that first day in February 1995, it was still widely believed that there was no way the governments were going to create an independent international criminal court that would not be controlled by the Security Council. Uh, but we did get it, we did achieve it. Um, it is a very important and great institution for the international legal order. And I hope we will all use days like today to recommit to how we can make this a success for peace and security on this planet. Thank you very much, Bill. And thank you all for joining us this morning. We'd like to thank in particular the ASP and ICC's leadership for joining us today, as well as our civil society members organizations from around the world. 
A special thanks to the International Bar Association who helped us with the technical logistics of this meeting. With that, the session is closed. Thank you again for joining us today. Thank you, bye-bye.